Uh, he's the author of many articles and monographs, uh, co-author with Bob, Bob Schutinger of 40 Centuries of Wage and Price Controls, and also his latest work, Hayek, His Contribution to the Political and Economic Thought of Our Time, uh, which Dr. Butler will be pleased to sign at the back if you'd like to hurry along after the talk. Uh, he's due to speak to us upon the subject of, let's get it right here, Are We Still on the Road to Serfdom? Dr. Raymond Butler. Uh, Chris Payne has just informed me of the various delights uh, that uh, are available to people who didn't want to come to the boring talk after lunch. Uh, these, I note, in include a visit to Hampton Court, and I must say I'm outraged. If there was anywhere that is more of a symbol of the outrageous intoxication of power of British monarchs uh, and the demise of the rules of law and the... Uh, the, the, the building up of vast empires for, for personal gain, uh, it is Hampton Court. And uh, so you're far more edifying uh, to be here, I think. Um, if it had been lit written by a, a lesser man, Hayek's Road to Serfdom, I think, would have been dismissed simply as another war book. Um, fortunately, it turned out instead to be a classic piece of historic explanation, historical explanation, which alerted the people of the nations who were actually uh, fighting Nazi Germany that they were by no means immune from the same virus that had uh, caused such awful horrors in that country. Since he was fluent in the culture of Britain and Germany, fluent in both languages. Hayek was particularly well placed to look at these uh, trends, and he uh, told the British in his book in 1944 that there was nothing congenitally vicious about the Germans that made them uh, go into this peculiarly wicked uh, way. Uh, in fact, the uh, prevailing wartime assumption that some deep ethical division existed between uh, the Germans and other nations uh, served only to disguise the fact that the same things could happen in other countries. And Hayek's great contribution, of course, is to remind us that we are all potentially uh, susceptible to travel down that road to serfdom. Well, the book itself constitutes uh, a clear, logical, linear argument of how totalitarianism can develop without needing a revolutionary episode to bring it about. And that was something new at the time. The tragedy of this, of course, is always that those with the, the highest ideals, the democratic socialists, the people who want to see equality without undermining uh, democratic institutions, these are the very people who regrettably pipe us down those first few steps along the road to serfdom before they realize that the achievement of their ideals actually is only possible if they resort to more and more coercive methods that uh, the idealists themselves would be the first to reject. But, of course, by the time one is on this road, it's, it's too late. Uh, the, the surging traffic is all one way, and it's very difficult to backtrack. Well, hi. By all means. Well, Hayek's belief was that the same processes um, under which... Bravo. Some men stand a little taller than others. Uh, Hayek's belief was that the same processes under which high-minded men uh, lead us into considerable hor horrors that were no part of their original intention uh, were becoming plain in the very countries that were actually trying to defeat Nazi Germany. And his pinpointing of the the symptoms caused widespread shock. Many socialist intellectuals, like Lord Keynes, you'll remember, uh, said that he was not only in agreement with what Hayek had written, but in deeply moved agreement. And other people, like um, George Orwell, who actually reviewed the uh, Road to Serfdom in the Observer newspaper, uh, went on from there to write Animal Farm in 1984 and to criticize the same trend in, in his own way. Well, are we still on the road to serfdom? To find out, I think it's uh, useful, if you'll indulge me, just to go very quickly through the argument of the road to serfdom uh, so that we can uh, 
see whether we're in fact on that road and how many milestones we have passed. Um, of course, <laughs> serfdom could come uh, from many routes and it may be that uh, uh, we will find ourselves on a, another route which Hayek didn't chart. But uh, Hayek has given us a fairly clear and logical argument, I think, of how it's possible to slowly slip uh, into uh, a totalitarian uh, regime. And so I think it's a very useful guide um, the first point that Hayek makes is that there were special circumstances in the case of Germany. Um, special circumstances, in other words, could make the descent into totalitarianism more or less likely. Uh, in uh, Germany, he talks about the last 70 years, meaning presumably the period since 1878, in which you've had, of course, the decline of imperial Germany, you've had uh, massive, unprecedented rates of inflation, uh, you've had various other circumstances, an electoral system that gave disproportionate uh, say to minorities and so on. All of these things are obviously important factors in, in the case of Germany. The second thing is that Hayek thinks that the intellectual confusion between uh, power and freedom is a crucial one and is one which is at the roots of totalitarian ideas. A world in which power is concentrated in a few hands, uh, is one that is ripe to be plucked uh, by totalitarians. It's easy to convince the masses that who have little to spend and uh, scant hope of making very much political contribution or many political decisions, it's easy to convince them that they are being denied freedom when what they're actually short of is power. They're, they're short of purchasing power, they're short of political power. And, and so... Uh, easy to, to make this uh, point. Even fairly liberal intellectuals have made the same confusion between power and freedom. And so changes that have nothing to do with the advancement of liberty and everything to do with the concentration of power uh, and political might in new hands, these come to be given a high moral justification that they do not, in fact, deserve. Well, all this is preparation for the road to serfdom. Uh, the third thing is really the, the first step downwards. Hayek says that this comes when we've come to believe in the inevitability of economic planning. One source of that is the presumption that our prodigious power over the physical world can be translated into a similar control over social and economic spheres. The idea that the market can generally be improved uh, if the, the aimlessness of the free market is replaced by the, the crisp, clear, straight turnpikes of a planned economy. Well, another is the reason, of course, is the, the theory that capitalism tends to become increasingly concentrated, that industries become larger and larger until they eventually grow into monopolies. This is basic to Marx's analysis, of course. And so it seems quite reasonable to say that if uh, industry is bound to become more monopolistic as time goes on, it would be very wise if we had that power wielded by some uh, representative body of the public rather than a few uh, capitalists who happen to be particularly lucky. Well, the fourth stage, I think, is that once we've decided that we can uh, improve this market and that we can wield this massive... Uh, these massive globules of power in the public interest, we then face the, the knotty problem of exactly what the, the public interest is. And again, Hayek says that uh, it's rather as if we set off on a journey. Uh, there are several of us on the journey. We've all agreed that this is something that we ought to undertake. But when we start on the journey, uh, we find that nobody's actually agreed as to where we are actually going to. Uh, so we've all bought a ticket, uh, but uh, none of us has any idea as to where we want to go, and we end up going nowhere that any of us really wanted to start in the first place. So uh, since there's no agreement on uh, the precise ends of our, our brave new planning regime, and far less, I think, on the choice of means that should be employed to achieve any particular aim, the legislature degenerates into a, a talking shop. It never gets anything done. And that means, of course, that uh, there's always an, a, a discomfort among the public who, who want to see a stronger government, and they urge 
uh, that government to become more, more strong. But a more important thing, perhaps, is the fact that the legislature, because it is so overworked trying to run the affairs of a complete nation, the legislature is bound to have to delegate some of its authority, some of its powers, to administrators. And this, uh, the fifth stage, is where Hayek says the rule of law really starts to, be, to break down. Uh, the decisions of the new army of administrators, arbitrary though they are, these are the things that now control our lives. And secondly, of course, the old laws must be discarded anyway if we're to marshal the resources of a nation towards a particular end. Uh, if we're aiming at a particular end, then the old rules of morality can't stand up. Uh, we must scrap them uh, if they stand in the way. And so we discover that the property, the liberty, and even the life of nobody can be spared if it is needed to help build that brave new world. But then, uh, as Beatrice Webb uh, said of the murders of the white Russians during the revolution, uh, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. Um, control of the, the economy, of course, says Hayek, this is the next step, means that you have control over all aspects of an individual's life, because money is simply a medium, it's simply a tool by which you uh, achieve the things that you want to achieve. Uh, if you uh, earn money, you can spend it in taking holidays, uh, any, any, of, any things, or going to art, theatre, any of the, the non-monetary things. Uh, so the decision to work or to enjoy more leisure, to, to uh, have a necessary operation rather than take a holiday, to buy a new car or move to a bigger house, all of these things uh, are, can be controlled by someone who controls the earning and spending of money. And so it's possible for a government thereby to control every aspect of human life, including the aesthetic aspects and so on, and that takes us a step nearer to the road to, on the road to serfdom. The next stage, I think, is that inequality now becomes a major government problem. If uh, the government is controlling everything, or seem to be in control of everything, then those who think that they're not getting a good deal will naturally complain. If, on the other hand, things are left to the market, um, people realize that by working harder they tend to get paid more, that the government doesn't control wages or prices, then they can't really blame the government if they're badly off. They're more inclined to blame themselves or dismiss it as being simply bad luck or poor circumstances. But if the government is consciously in power, consciously controlling everything, then plainly people are going to attack the government and try to get out of it what they can. And one thing which uh, we in Britain know is that one thing that people do like to get out of a government that apparently controls the entire labor market is security. Uh, instead of uh, the prospect of losing their job, they would much prefer the government to guarantee them uh, a job. And so you've got all the problems about incentives. If you pay incentives, surely you have the same inequalities that this great revolution is supposed to, to end. If you don't have incentives, why should anyone work at all? Um, and in the end, what you get is a, a, a static, ossified, uh, labor market, uh, an ossified economy, really. Well, if you're going to <clears throat> try to work this ossified economy, this static economy, you've really got to have something of a military-style operation to do it. You've got to have some strong men who can stand up and can uh, uh, cut through the, 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 the sticky glue that surrounds the economy and uh, make it work. And it's at this point, of course, uh, which you'll be familiar with, that the dictator uh, tends to emerge. And the dictator, of course, uh, always tends to be the worst sort of person. Hayek's chapter heading is, why the worst get on top? Well, the answer is simple. Uh, you have to be ruthless in such a state in order to get ahead. Uh, you have to have a clear-sighted goal as to where you're aiming for uh, in order to convince people that they too should uh, channel their resources and energies and efforts to that goal. Um, somebody who's mealy mouthed about it, somebody who thinks that uh, the old rules of morality really ought to stand up, uh, these people are very unlikely to get into positions of power. 
simply because of the contradiction between the, the old rules of law and the, uh, the new marshalling of resources to a particular end. Um, of course, uh, good dictators uh, know that they have to get uh, all of the residents of a large and populous nation working together in order to achieve their single objective. And if so, it's not sufficient to control their values alone. Uh, the facts, too, must be controlled if those who are capable of making their own decisions are not to come to the wrong conclusion. And so a mighty propaganda machine has to be uh, brought into being uh, to provide official reports on every subject. And while the resources of the nation are being directed to the new goals, sources of doubt or discontent can't possibly be allowed to continue. Uh, if you're aiming at a particular goal, particular economic plan, uh, you're certainly not going to allow people to express doubts and maybe slow that plan down or, or maybe force people into rethinking and abandoning a whole project. So uh, these sources of doubt or discontent um, must, of course, be silenced. Um, however, a dictator usually doesn't have uh, very much... Uh, uh, well, he certainly has the stomach to do that and uh, quite frequently he has the predilection to do that as well. Anyway, this then is the ultimate destination of Hayek's view of the road to serfdom. When all activity is directed towards a single end, where the rule of law is perverted to that end, and where even those of independent mind can't be sure uh, what is true and what is false, assuming that they survive at all. So without the whim of the dictator... There is no art, no letters, no society, and, uh, which is worst of all, a continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Well, how many of these milestones, I hear you cry, have we asked, have we passed, and how many are still in sight? Or have we in fact stepped off, as I believe, the road to serfdom, uh, as Hayek himself believed would be possible if we uh, abandoned the original mistakes that got us on in the first place. Well, let's go through the points again. <clears throat> Firstly, turning to the special circumstances that uh, do encourage us onto the, the road, it's clear that the liber liberal democracies have uh, proved themselves remarkably resilient. Where totalitarian regimes have grown up, it's usually been as a byproduct of a more general war, as in Eastern Europe, uh, through conquest uh, by totalitarian powers, as in South Vietnam, or by the sudden granting of uh, imperial power almost to nations who have no history or tradition of wielding it, as in, let's say, Zimbabwe. Uh, it remains an open question, of course, whether the liberal democracies will possess a, a sufficient reserve to avoid the road to serfdom, but we will see. I think there is considerable optimism uh, is justified on that particular point. The special circumstances of the present era have produced a widespread inclination, I think, away from the idea of the planned economy rather than towards it. It's completely different from wartime Germany. The failure of planned economies to deliver the, their promised uh, land of plenty, uh, their universal tendency to foster oligarchy or uh, dictatorship, their unpleasant habit of dealing with dissidents by dumping them at best in psychiatric hospitals and at worst in uh, mass burial pits, uh, these things have actually been noticed by the ordinary man in the street, and they do stand as a warning side, sign alongside the road to serfdom. Even modest attempts to control of a, an economy have been such a complete mess that people have begun to, well, uh, they've been inclined to argue that they should be ended rather than extended. Uh, it's completely the opposite uh, to what it was in uh, the Germany that Hayek was talking about. So, in summary, I would say on that first point that Hayek makes that the, uh, the circumstances of the last 70 years through most of the, the globe here has left our minds disposed against the dangerous ideals of collectivism rather than in favour. Well, what about this confusion of power and uh, freedom that, that I mentioned? Uh, certainly, I think that uh, there has been 
uh, continual error. However, um, the power of the argument that uh, what you're really short of is freedom, uh, give me the power and I will make sure you have the freedom, the, the paucity of that argument has been opened up by many things. Firstly, um, opportunities have extended very much more widely to the ordinary man in the street. Education has opened up prospects that our parents uh, could hardly have dreamed of, well, no, that they wouldn't dare hope for, and that our grandparents could, in fact, never have dreamed of. Um, women, minorities, self-made men, all of these people are in much more social esteem now than they were, say, 40 years ago when Hayek wrote. So what I'm saying there is that ordinary individuals today have far greater freedom to better themselves, and with it, they acquire more power to acquire uh, what it is that they really seek, whatever that might be. And therefore, they, they have more power, they're less susceptible to that argument. Uh, secondly, I think greater economic equality and the devolution of economic power progressively into the hands of ordinary individuals uh, and away from a limited class of capitalists has reduced the obvious divide uh, in society. Those who do best in market economies are the poor people. And I think that they're beginning, you know, they begin to realize that. Um, the market economy gives them things that, again, that they could never have dreamed of a few years ago, more quickly, more cheaply. And that tendency of the market to raise the well-being of the, uh, those at the bottom uh, produces a necessary and important counterbalance to uh, the discontent that Marx thought was inevitable in a capitalist economy. Well, for all these, well, there's another reason as well, of course, which is that the freedom promised by revolutionaries uh, has turned out to be a nightmare of power, and that we've all read Animal Farm, and we all recognize uh, that what was advertised as an expansion of freedom simply turned out to be a transfer of power from one set of hands into another. A slightly less uh, liberal set of hands, too. Anyway, on the third point that Hayek makes... Um, I would say, then, that the, the heyday of the planned economy ideal uh, is actually past. It's, uh, it's an old idea. It was a product of the 19th century, where the world did seem to be coalescing into uh, large industrial uh, meg megaliths. And the economies of scale that were possible in all of the old 19th century uh, industries seem to have no limit. But those things are very rapidly changing. I suppose the, I mean, if you regard economic planning as an art form, I, I imagine its heyday must have been in the 1920s, where you had Le Corbusier planning these vast uh, machines for living in, in neat rows, connected by, to the industrial centers by rapid, publicly owned, of course, mass transit systems. Well, when that was actually tried, as it was after the devastation of the war, uh, we saw that for the nightmare rather than the dream that it really was. So I think that the planning ideal has uh, lost some of its enchantment, and uh, it is in fact failing uh, with increased speed. It's failing partly because of Hayek himself and economic theorists like him. It's failing also because the structure of industry, and this, I think this is the crucial point, the structure of industry in uh, the developed world is changing remarkably rapidly, and has changed in the last few decades. In 1944, uh, it seemed as if the big, huge industries coalescing into monopolies and therefore requiring state control, that, that these things would continue forever. But look at the industries today. They're smaller, they're lighter, and they're in the hands of a much more widespread group of people. Uh, the heavy in industry that produces large enterprises is on the decline, and with it the threat of monopolistic power and therefore the need to uh, take those jobs into public ownership. We've actually exported in the developed world a lot of the old dirty jobs, the big manu heavy manufacturing jobs, we've exported those into the third world. And probably it's there that the next uh, steps onto the road to serfdom are likely to occur. The future in the developed world is in smaller industries. It's in cold storage, packaging, distribution, consultancy, scientific research, finance, publishing, banking, theme parks, discos, uh, gardening, garden centers. All of these things, many of them service industries, these are the things that are growing most rapidly in the developed world. 
And by their nature, those industries lack any large economies of scale. So industry is actually becoming less concentrated. There's much less need to take it into public ownership. And that, again, I think is being, uh, being understood. Um, there's another important trend as well, almost equally important, perhaps equally important, and that is the, the rapid advance in communications and data processing and so on. What that means is, is that things that could formerly be done only by huge, great bureaucracies, which meant that firms had to be of a, a large size to sustain them, these things can now be done on desktop computers. What would have taken a room of clerks this big, writing letters, copying letters, and so on. Well, we don't do that anymore. Everybody has a Xerox. Uh, or, you know, writing letters by hand. You don't need a dozen clerks to do that. You can type it yourself on a, on a typewriter. Or doing the accounts and so on. Well, that can be done in every, every branch uh, on an ordinary, very cheap computer. It doesn't need a big central overhead. And so, again, uh, there's this great tendency for industry to, to fragment much more than it used to be. Well, um, let's move on, I think, to uh, Hayek's next point. Um, the post-war growth of government functions on their piecemeal and haphazard path has led to more decisions being placed in the hands of bureaucracy. Hayek is absolutely right, that has happened. Uh, the opportunity for administrative fiat by government servants uh, particularly environmental planners, is uni universally known. But it's also universally hated. And the dangers of the administrative octopus are being resisted. As the administrators have made more embarrassing mistakes, as the inspectors have compounded the obvious and evident injustices, and as the planners have in inflicted even more hideous monstrosities upon the landscape, uh, the days of these officials um, are actually numbered. Television and radio and a much more active press are all developments which has uh, brought home to us very clearly the dangers of the worst results of this administrative despotism. And so today I would say that the new political capital is to be made by ending this uh, despotism and not by ex extending it and putting more power in the hands of officials. Well, even so, I think that the attack on bureaucracy is one of the most difficult parts of the state to roll back. It requires politicians to deal effectively with people who are themselves very efficient political organizers. Uh, civil servants are past masters at resisting change, particularly when it involves uh, removing them from their jobs. Uh, Marx is absolutely right. You know, they follow their class interests. Uh, you know, I've got great sympathy for Marx. I think he was right on many things. He just didn't go far enough. But the, the self-interest of the government classes is one thing which he hadn't anticipated. Anyway, to uh, overcome these, these great intransigences means that the government's propaganda has got to be pretty good, that the propaganda of the uh, organizational classes has to be overcome, their arguments and their organizational power, very important, has to be defeated. And to be credible, I think you have to have a fairly well thought out program as to how you're going to replace these services that look necessary, these services that require so many administrators, uh, before you can actually start. So it's a very long job. So I don't think that we should be over-optimistic about the uh, uh, abilities or desire of politicians to pursue that m too rapidly. But the assault on the bureaucracy has begun. Well, Hayek's next uh, point that economic Planning invariably means control over political and uh, uh, moral life and every field of human aspirations um, has, of course, become a commonplace. Um, but again, people, I think, are very much more aware of it today than they are when Hayek wrote. Uh, we've got world travel, which is cheap and quick. Um, when we see British trade unions becoming an equal partner with the government, uh, when we see them deciding uh, whether patients should be admitted to hospital or not, uh, when we see them leaving the, uh, the dead unburied. Uh, these things, people can travel to Britain, they can see in the radio and TV uh, what is happening, 
and the, the effect is noticed. Or again, when a repressive regime builds a wall around itself or decides to uh, persecute its Jewish population, uh, we can go there, we can actually in that case go through the wall and talk to the people on the other side um, fairly cheaply, very much more opportunity for that kind of uh, relationship between different people than existed before. So what I'm saying is that this improved communication, the improved travel, which is going to increase as we get more leisure and cheaper, cheaper travel, all of this uh, brings home the message of how uh, repressive some of these regimes are. And of course, the spread of wealth to ordinary people has had its effect. Uh, ordinary people today have very much more of a stake in their own economic life. They don't want to see it nationalized. Um, I would say also that the ossification of the labor market um, is something which people have woken up to. They've seen the effects of a complete guarantee, government guarantee on employment, for example. Uh, they, they see the awful aura of self-interest in which uh, appeals for job security or government subsidies are always wrapped, and that, again, I think has its an effect. Um, now, let's you remember that Hayek's next point is that because the economic planning rapidly gets you into such a mess, there's a great popular belief that we really need strong government. Well, I think that is true today. But the strong government that people are seeking today this is a strong government that's going to cut through this nonsense rather than to extend it even further. Um, people don't want to get deeper into this quagmire. They want someone who's going to take us out. So again, I think that that... Uh, that motive is extremely strong. And Hayek, of course, was right when he said that in a dictatorship, one has to control the very facts themselves. You've got to control information. And uh, I feel very optimistic on this particular score, I must say, because um, information today, fortunately, is almost impossible to control. There's so much of it. It circulates cheaply, efficiently, and indeed instantaneously in so many forms that it's beyond the power of modern government to control at all. The Soviet Union, for example, you might have read in the papers, is, is presently debating whether it should allow in ordinary home microcomputers. Why is where's the problem with that? I hear you cry, but it's simple. If you have a microcomputer, all you've got to do is push a button and it'll produce you 20 copies of any pamphlet that you happen to have written attacking the, the Soviet authorities. Now, uh, when you can do that, when you've got that, or push another button and you can communicate it automatically to somebody down the road. Now, when you've got that kind of information power, there's very little that the central authorities can do to resist it. Uh, and so the authorities in the Soviet Union correctly see that as a great threat to the Soviet system, and they're very worried. What do they do? Do they stop computers coming in? Do they have them all plugged into a central bureaucracy that monitors everything that's put on them? Oh, I hope they do that. That's going to be brilliant. Or, uh, or, you know, do they restrict the supply of home computers to those who really need them? Uh, well, they've got real problems, and I can see what's going to happen is the information gap between them and the, and the West is going to increase uh, at a great rate. And, of course, another thing which worries the repressive powers is the uh, tremendous increases in communication via satellite. Once you can get a satellite putting out ordinary British or American, you know, Dallas TV shows into the heart of the Soviet Union, uh, a satellite with a big enough fit footprint so that anybody in the Soviet Union can put a, a small bit of chicken wire on his roof and uh, pull down those programs and see what life in the West is really like, that's really going to shake them. And, uh, of course, one or two stations uh, creeping over from the West you can dismiss as being simple propaganda. Well, when you've got hundreds of competing uh, systems all over the United States and Western Europe, all of which are accessible to people in the, uh, behind the Iron Curtain, I think that um, that's a very different thing. Um, so I think um, I'll, I'll wind up by concluding that I'm, I'm very optimistic because the nature of uh, society is changing. Uh, Marx again was right to some extent. The social relations are to some extent dependent upon the, uh, the means of production. And the means of production are allowing us to insulate ourselves from the state much more. It's, we're becoming very much more small scale in our operations. 
And uh, we're able to insulate ourselves by doing for ourselves what would formally require the massive coercive empire of a large business or state enterprise. And so my conclusion from all this is that the past has shown us the follies of state control. The present is making it possible for ordinary people to escape that state control. And the future will leave the state even more impotent. Um, looking at the past, attempts to produce planned economies in the past have not yielded the promised harvest. Uh, the mild attempts have just produced confusion, while the most stringent have produced the most unacceptable horrors. And this experience dogs every footstep of those who would wish to take us down the road to serfdom. Looking to the present, uh, the benefits of a diverse and uh, competitive economy are being appreciated. People have greater wealth to acquire those benefits, and they're more reluctant to give up their stake in it. They're demanding alternatives to state services and they have the means and the technology uh, to escape, escape state services and control. In the future, uh, economic units will, I think, continue to get smaller and smaller. Self-employment will replace the factory proletariat, and with it will go the last vestige of Marxist theory. Communication will continually improve, making it ever more possible to do at the level of the individual what once required the kind of centralization that is prey uh, to collectivism. New service industries with few economies of scale and thus little inclination towards monopoly will emerge as the old industrial jobs are exported to other countries. Well, uh, David Hume, who is quoted by Hayek on the title page of The Road to Serfdom, uh, said that uh, it is seldom that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. I think it's perhaps even more rare uh, to find liberty restored all at once. It's happened about once in recent years that I can think of. But uh, the, the point is that having stepped off the road to serfdom, it would be a mistake uh, to suppose that our way back would be at all easy or at all quick. It'll be many decades before the attitudes that brought us so far will actually be completely overcome. But fortunately, past experience and future technology will keep us traveling in, this, in the right direction. And, Mr. Chairman, in my judgment, the first few and perhaps faltering steps back have already been made. Thank you.